The next time I tore one up was on my 30th mission. Uh, we were out on a strafing mission. And uh, there was a, a whole set of marshaling yards and whatnot that ran from Linz, Austria, southeast for about 100 miles. And it was well-traveled, a lot of traffic. But they would see you, the Germans would see you go over, and they knew perfectly well that next amount of time you'd be coming back, they could see you. And the trains would go in the tunnels and whatnot. And quite often coming back, you know, everything's under control. They might say, hey, a couple of flights, look for targets of opportunity. And we would look up and down this track and nothing. But we knew where they were at, but they were smart enough to get <laughs> out of the way before we got back. Well, the 15th Air Force said, we're gonna fix these guys. They had a special mission that they signed to the 332nd. The 332nd gave the mission to the 99th Fighter Squadron. So on that day, it was the 14th of March. We got up early, went up to the briefing room. They were saying, oh man, if you guys got a mission going, a special mission, you're gonna take off immediately, you know, once, his, once the sun starts coming up because we didn't have any lights or nothing on the runway and we're gonna run this special mission. So we had maximum effort. We had about the 18, 19, 20 airplanes or so. So we take off early in the morning, fly all the way up to this area, this 100 mile strip. And we get up down on the southeast end of it. And all we can see, you know, is cold, what we not, we can see the steam coming up from the locomotives. And what we said, my God, I mean, just loaded with traffic. So we are, we stopped here, and I was in the lead flight again with Camel. We dropped one flight off, go up 10, 15 miles, drop off another flight another flight, then the lead flight was all the way up close to Lentz. And we we're just strafing this whole area and all the chatter was going on. Hey, I just got this one. Boy, did you see that one blow up? And we had a field day, a very successful day. So then we reached this point and then we turn around and as we came down, we started collecting each of the flights as we came down. So we get down to where we started at, and we're circling to form up and getting ready to go home. And Camel says, hey, we missed one down there. You know, and he says, you guys wait for Brown and I is gonna go down and get him. So we go down after him, and I was flying his wing that day. And he goes in, I could see smoke coming from his guns. Then he breaks off, he says, I'm out of ammunition. That's what I got a few bullets left. So I got this locomotive, and that locomotive has lit up like a damn Christmas tree. I am right on target. And I'm saying, God damn it, blow. It's time for it to blow. And I said, I got to get out of here. And just as I pull up, that's when it blew. If I had pulled up another second or two earlier, I would have cleared. But just as I went over, it blew and jumped from the locomotive damage my aircraft. So as I get up, I started losing oil pressure. Yeah. Temperature is going up. Then the guys picked up a lot of smoke. My radios went out. One of them came up next to me was pointing to the back. So I looked back and I'm trailing smoke. I said, oh crap. Then the next thing I know, boom, I lose all my coolant that comes out across the windshield. Or once you lose your coolant, that engine's only going to run a matter of seconds. It's going to freeze up. So I said, you know, damn it, I just lost my coolant. Well, if that, I'm at a low altitude, so I had to get out in a hurry. So I just rolled it over, popped the nose up. I had jettisoned the canopy, and you pop the nose up, and it throws you out. And I pulled the chute, and the chute works. Okay, so now I'm safe as sound. But the guys in the leaf fly circle me, and I could see Cam on the other guy, Lucas, uh, who was in the flight. And I could see them sitting in their cockpits as they come. 
you know, around me and whatnot. And then I'm floating in the chutes and I could hear the airplanes and the guys, you know, sound goes off. I landed and I thought, what in the hell am I doing all by myself, 20 years old, looking like this up in Germany? I said, oh, crap. And I said, well, wait a minute here, you know. So I knew precisely just about where I was at. So I pulled out my, my skate kit that you always carry. I had a small map. And I said, doggone, if I could just evade for about eight days or so, I think I can make it to the Russian lines. Well, that was short-lived because up on the hill, all of a sudden, there's a couple of constables or, you know, civilian sheriffs, I mean, you know, with pistols and rifles and whatnot. And uh, I was down right close to a wooded area. And they jumped off their steeds, and I saw them point their guns at me. Well, I took my gun and threw it away and, you know, held up my hand. So they take me back to one of the villages that we had just strayed. And I was met by about 35, 40 of the angriest people I have ever seen in my life. Later on, as I thought about that whole incident, I thought, they had every right to be angry. If I had been sitting there and a piece of shrapnel hit my wife or my kid, and here comes a guy down in the parachute, I would want to get a piece of him. And that is precisely what it was. And here's where it really got interesting. You know, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile, Harold, there's nothing you can do. You can't run. You can't hide. So I said, well, it looks like I'm going to die. And I was trying to accept the fact that, Harold, you only got a few minutes to live. And they found the tree was a perfect hanging tree. And they're going, you know, boom, boom. You see those kinds of signals. Some of them had ski poles and was doing this towards me and whatnot. And they're howling, they're screaming. They take me down to the tree. And really, I was talking to myself. I said, Harold, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know or whatnot. I said, I guess I'll, when they get ready to do it, I'll just respond. And whatever happens, happens. They'll either shoot me or something. But I knew I was going to die. And um, there was one good man in the back. <clears throat> I didn't even notice him. But for just a moment, I saw someone, another one walking. I completely ignored him. So I was concerned with my own problem. And I felt a hand on my shoulder. He snatched me back. He steps in front of me, puts a round in his rifle. And he's screaming at him in German. And they're screaming back at him. You know, and they're doing this. And he's pointing his, you know, his rifle and whatever they're saying which I don't understand. So we start backing up. We backed up what amounted to, I would say a couple of blocks or so, into the little, you know, in this little village. There was a pub there. We go to the pub, there's a few people, and he runs everybody out. 